Welcome back, one and all, to more Eric the Unready. Eric dissolves Miracle Diet. I ate 125 bananas in two days and lost 50 pounds. Dissolve, did I say dissolves? I meant discovers. A very selective earthquake struck Ulrich's house of torches yesterday. Although no trembles were felt elsewhere in the village, the quake completely leveled Ulrich's establishment. This is the second time as in many months that Ulrich has suffered a catastrophic loss. It just caused a shout that the gods can strike with pinpoint accuracy, said one of the religious leaders. Ulrich must have pissed them off big time. Leading psychic Phineas the Seer has predicted that the spirit of the late minister Elvis Prestley will rise from the dead tonight. Presley is buried at the cemetery at the edge of the Enchanted Forest. Phineas is setting tickets to the events in which he has acquired soil promotional rights. He expects a crowd of several thousand fans who will still carry a torch for the late singer. Scientists have discovered a new pro properties of the Roddenberry Bush, long treasured by villagers of the Rim Counties for its dying. The bush may now into a period of more widespread popularity. It is now known that Edian Roddenberry heightens one sense of direction. While this goes a long way toward explaining the lack of signposts in Rimwood's villages, the discovery is expected to be of most interest to explorers of the great Sara Lee Desert. Peter, I won't be able to make it this year. Something's come up. Say hi to the kids and take her for me. Love, Wendy. Alright. We also have a book here. As you open the book, a coupon flutters out and you grab it in midair. When you return your attention to the book, your eyes fall on the lines. In the great days of Balder, you immediately begin to feel sleepy, but you manage to snap the book shut before any serious damage is done. Good for five free acting lessons with the bard. Let's head into the Enchanted Forest. You are deep in the heart of the Enchanted Forest. Sinister-looking trees loom all around you, and every time you look away, I could swear one of them is changing positions out of the corner of your eye. One tree in particular seems to be regarding you with evil intent. Its gnarled roots look like they're just waiting for the opportunity to fuck you up. The way back to the cemetery lies to the east, and the pass continues to the west. Cease thy check, Henry Violet. Let me pass. Ooh, listen to the fancy words. It's a pretty nice trunk you got there. I'd hate to see any termites get on it. You don't scare me. There are no termites in this world. Look, it's Haley's Comet. Sorry, Haley's Comet isn't due for another 42 years. If I was Sir Lancelot, you'd let me by. I knew Sir Lancelot. I worked with Sir Lancelot, and believe me, you will know Sir Lancelot. Stand aside. I come in the name of the king. I don't care who you come in the name of. Keep your love life out of this. I've been talking. Now, time for action. I'm gonna eat the tree. Wouldn't you rather be playing one of those leisure suit adventure games? I'm gonna bite the tree. The tree says, Sorry, old chap. No vampires on Taurus, you know. Perhaps you've wandered into the wrong dimension. Kill the tree. The tree says, Piss off, you wimp. You reflect on a more peaceful approach to this situation. Remove the float from your backpack first. The liquid seeps into the ground at the base of the tree. Suddenly all the roots spring straight up like a hair on the back of a scarred cat. They start to quiver, and then they begin to weave around drunkenly. A few of the smaller ones start singing a song about their dear mother that they left behind in Ireland. They squeeze by the weaving roots, and head deep into the forest. You have arrived in a clearing at the very center of the forest. An enormous tree grows here, and the wizard's words immediately echoed in your mind. The pitchfork of Democles is entangled in the leaves of the tallest tree in the Enchanted Forest. Barely able to contain your excitement, you sight up along the tree. High above you, the trunk branches out into the roots. Slowly, even for you, comprehension dawns. The tree is growing upside down. Whatever leaves it may have must be hidden underground. The base of the tree is an unruly pile of branches. The way back into the forest lies to the east. Push aside a pile of the branches and discover an ancient trap door set into the ground. You grasp the ring and pull. The door creaks open, creating yet another opportunity for a neat sound effect. 
You see a gloomy set of stairs leaning underground. You start to feel your way down the stairs. As soon as you disappear below ground level, you hear a crash overhead. Looking up, you see the trapdoor quivering with satisfaction that it has lived up to its name. You continue down the stairs, and at the bottom you walk through a revolving spike turnstile. On the other side of the door is a sign. You see a small mailbox here, but you can't see shit. You open the mailbox and discover some mail. It's a notice from the Dwarves Clearing House. Yes, Founder Bindlecrank, you may have already won the grand prize in the 115th annual Make-A-Wish sweepstakes. Soon, you all will be having little Bindlecranks who will be enjoying the dream of a lifetime. Simply bring this winning notice to our headquarters in the Great Cavern. Our courteous and friendly staff will tell you which of the fabulous prizes you have won, with absolutely no sales pressure to buy one of our magazines or sit through an incredibly boring presentation on vacation real estate. Let's take the mailbox. Just because I ripped you off doesn't mean I'm going to let you steal it. Fine. This is a huge underground cavern. There are buildings to the northeast and south. High above you the branches of a tree are sticking down from the roof of the cavern. In the branches you see the pitchfork of Democles. The little white house lies somewhere out to the side to the east. Let's go to Fran Rock's Emporium. You walk into the veritable showcase of rocks. Big rocks, little rocks, shiny rocks, dull rocks. Precious stones, base metals. The only exit is to the southwest, and behind the counter is a Fran, a plaid clad dwarf. Can I interest you in anything? Fran asks. I was looking for something in a rock. You reply. Ah, well, you've come to the right place. Just look around. Let me know if anything there catches your fancy. And remember, there's a free bungee card with every purchase to last rock to help you car to the to last to the rock to your car to help you get it home. In the counter, you see a headrest special and a star to rock. Guy reminds me of Stan from Monkey Island. This is the lobby of a small building. There is a dwarf standing in front of a wall full of redwood clocks. The only way out is north. Look at cock, look at the clocks. Clocks are cheap knockoffs that were stamped out of the mindless assembly line, pennies apiece. You're standing in an open field west of a white house with a boarded front door. A path winds off to the west, and the north is a revolving spike turnstile through which you entered. Next to the turnstile is a small hand lettered sign. You see the small, small bail marks here. With the pickaxe, you slip the business end of the pickaxe under the board and give it a good heave. The board pops loose and you push it to one side. You squeeze through the opening of the door and find yourself in a kitchen that reeks of garlic and other nasty shit. A quick survey of the room reveals nothing of interest. Holding your breath, you dash into the living room, as if you're running from somebody's fart. This is a dark room with a trophy case along one wall and an ancient oriental rug on the floor. Stairs lead up to the second floor and the kitchen lies to the west. In the trophy case you see a beard. The case isn't open. Okay. Ah, well, we have a slight difficulty there. The case appears to be locked. And as this is an adventure game, I can hardly allow you to open it unless you supply the proper key. That quibble aside, however, I consider your input to have been absolutely first-rate.
You roll back the rug and discover a trap door. All right, so moving the rug, we find another door, which we're gonna open. You struggle with the heavy door and manage to raise it a few inches. A muffled voice comes from somewhere down below. Haven't you people bothered me enough? Go away. A frail white arm emerges and hands you a key. Then it disappears into the darkness again and pulls the door shut. After it with a decisive bang. Okay, maybe we can use the key on the case. You unlock the case with the key and it gets open. Now we can get the beard. You take the beard from the trophy case. You race up the stairs. Ooh, a pile of bones. Let's look in the bones. You sit through the pile and discover a driver's license, which you immediately pick up. Along with the bones, right? You've already got what you need from the pile of bones. Now stop being ghoulish and leave them alone, you fucking maniac. Fondo Biddlecrank, age 437, height 3 foot 6 inches. The pictures of a luxurious beard with what may be a dwarf behind it. How's the weather down here? What an original line. I haven't heard that from a human since at least the time I met, last met one. You know, if you keep your mouth open like that, a bug might fly in it. That's the idea. I like bugs. I see you left a really big tie at home. Good move. When I got up this morning, I said to myself, gee, maybe when I'm at work today, I'll be insulted by some human who eats 60 bananas a day. Thanks for making my green dream come true. Please wait a minute while my eyes adjust to the glare coming off your head. Fine, I'll just stand here and bask in your reflected glory until you deem to speak to me again. What happened to my screen back when I first came to the revolving store? It was just a nostalgic flashback on part of the author, don't worry. I'm done talking now. What a disappointment, you're breaking my heart. Smart ass little shit of a dwarf. I don't like smart ass dwarfs, I'm killing them. The dwarf kicks you in the knee. The dwarf hauls out a redwood cloak cock and starts to hand it to you. Then he gives the ticket to board glance. My gods, an actual winner! He, reco he quickly recovers his composure and says, Ahem, that is to say, another winner, among many in our fine, absolutely legal with no hanky-panky sweepstakes. He compares your number to the one on the list. Well, Mr. Bindleclink, I'm happy to say that you've won an all express paid. He glances up at you in front. Wait a minute! You don't look like a dwarf! May I see some sort of ID, please? The dwarf glances at the picture on the license. This doesn't look like you at all. The found old biddle crank in this photo has a big bushy beard. He hands back the license and the sweepstake notice and says, Be off with you. You're lucky if I'm not calling the fraud squad. You hear a small voice in your head say, The dwarf will not be fooled if you put on the beard in his presence. Go outside and do it. Okay, okay. God damn it, I can't type. Oh, we need to get shorter too, so go ahead and kneel. <coughs> the beard begins to itch. You shovel off painfully on your knees. I notice the dwarf is a lot happier to see us. Mr. Bendercrink, I'm happy to say that you've won an all expense paid. Oh, I almost forgot. I need some ID. The dwarf pats you in the arm and says, Enjoy. You've won an all expense paid day at the Magical Dwarf theme park, courtesy of the Magic Construction Company. He takes you by the arm and walks you out into the Great Cavern. There, like high-speed time-lapse photography, a construction crew builds a huge theme park right before your eyes. You are standing on the midway. Blah, 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 blah. Right next to you is a huge ferris wheel whose cars almost brush the leaves of the tree, hanging down from the cavern roof. To the west is a game booth, 
into the southeast and southwest or rise. French Rock Emporium can still be entered to the northeast. The Dwarves Clearing House is still visible to the south, and a little white house lies somewhere to the east. One of the seats on the Ferris wheel dangles in front of you. You see a lever here. The beard is really itchy. You begin to scratch wildly. I beg your pardon. Go ahead and drop a save game here. You enter a small booth where a dwarf has set up a table with cards on it. Care for a game of mental skill? He asked. If you win, I'll give you my magic slingshot. If you lose, it costs you nothing. Here's how we play. I deal out some cards, face down, and it will take turns. Then we'll two at a time. If we make a match, you get to another turn. Watch out, because one of the cards is dynamite, which makes you lose your turn. Whoever gets the most matches wins. Ready? I'll go first. What the fuck? I guess we have to play some kind of crazy game of memory here. Oh, there's the rope. You fucking piece of shit, dwarf. What a little fucking cocksucker. Too bad! Oh, God damn it. I can't remember shit. This is fucking terrible. Anyways, I'll come back when I'm actually making progress and not getting my ass. Alright. Just had to play him one more time and I'm whooping his monkey ass. Right, bitch. Yeah, who's your daddy? If he wins all of them, I still win. Good for you. Good for you. And you're a fucking idiot. You win 12 pairs to 5. Congratulations, he says. Here's your prize. It's a really great slingshot, but be careful. It's got magic in it. You hit whatever you shoot at. He hands you the slingshot. Well, goodbye. I really enjoyed playing the game with you, but don't have any more prizes. You can come back whenever you like, though. We'll just play for fun. See you later. Score has gone up by ten. You take off the beard and breathe a sigh of relief. That sucker really itches. You rise from the kneeling position. Ta la 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 la, life is so wonderful. 
You bellow until your throat gets sore. You jump up and down a few times and then need to rest. No, I don't want to play again. Jesus Christ, you retard. Look at that, I can just, uh... A dwarf family wanders by. The father addresses your neighbor. Great costume. The kids really go for that goofy-looking human stuff. I worked my way through rock you doing the same sort of thing. He presses a 20 kid piece in your hand. Good luck to you. The family wanders away. That was kind of odd. Ah, oh, well, you come to the right place. Just look around let me know if there's anything that catches your fancy. Remember, there's a free bungee cord with every purchase of the last rock and your car to help blah, 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 blah. Is it selling rocks to mine as a challenge? Not really. I come from a family of great salesmen. My Uncle Dan has shown the Emporium in Patty and Glacier. My sister Anne is a sander Emporium in the middle of the Sally Desert. My cousin Van sells coloring books to blind people. And the only black sheep in the family is Stan. Stan. There's a course of black sheep called Stan. He sells things that people really need, but I don't want to talk about him. Why is it called Starter Rock? Because it's perfect for a couple just starting out. You may not be able to afford a larger rock, but this little bit will set you back 20s on mids. It's a sound investment. And it's got good resale value too, only many couples find they're never quite able to give up the first rock. Tell me about the Pitchfork of Damocles. It's in the bane of life here, in the NSGUE. Look at all the prime real estate that goes unused in the Great Cavern, all because people are afraid the Pitchfork may one day fall and kill someone. Do you think these balloons could carry me to the top of the cavern so I could get the Pitchfork? Grant knows the Daring actually tried that, and as soon as he got close to the Pitchfork, the tins popped all the balloons. He's got a lovely headstone, by the way. So long for now. Let's buy the starter rock. Friend reaches below the counter and hands you a rock about half the size of a dwarf's fist. For 20 zonkmints, we had the first to find starter rock. With every sale, a free bungee cord to lash the rock. He stops in mid sentence, looks first at the miniature rock, and then at the cord. Oh, well, he continues. You might as well take the cord anyway. I got to deal on him. Got to think for short, people, eh? The rock fits snugly into the slingshot. You throw the lever and hear a faint click. You sit down in the chair just outside the seat, but within easy reach. In the control box with two buttons on it, one green, one red. The wheel starts to spin, you climb higher and higher. Now you're almost at the very top and you can see the pitchfork just above you. Far below you see the theme park laid out on the cavern floor. You see Franz Rock and Porium the dwarf's clearing house. You can even see the lever, although it looks like a matchstick from his height. You take careful, a careful aim and fire away. The rock speeds through the air and strikes the button, halting the ferris wheel. You are now directly below the pitchfork. You stand up. And let's get the pitchfork. You stretch out and grab the pitchfork. 25 points. You hook one end of the bungee cord to the sturdy branch and the other to your clothing. The cord seems to relax and lengthen, as if it knows you're about to ask it to stretch a long distance. Alright, who's ready to bungee cord from here? You do a swan die off the seat. Gaining speed as you approach the floor of the cavern, you wonder if you should have read the small print on the bungee cord. The part where the lawyers say that if the product doesn't work, it's not their fault. At least you think. I'm not trying this at home. Then just as you come face to face with an aunt, the bungee reaches its limit and snaps you back. You bounce a few times and then come to rest a few feet above the ground. Just as you start to congratulate yourself, the far end of the cord comes free, and you fall the remaining few feet to land flat on your fucking face. Dazed but unhurt, you struggle to your feet and pick up the bungee cord. You are immediately surrounded by a crowd of cheery dwarfs. Thank you for removing the dread pitchfork, which has been hanging over our heads all these many years. In gratitude, we'd like to give you this rock. The crowd parts, and Fran walks up carrying the headrest special. He gives it to you. The crowd disassembles the theme park, and then melts away. 
I beg your pardon. All right, let's head east a couple times and then back upstairs. Now you see that hole in the ceiling? That's right. You dropped the headrest special. You step onto the rock and pull yourself into the attic. You are in a very dark, musty room. The ceiling seems to be a stone slab. It is dark enough in here that you are likely to be eaten by a new. Knowing in your heart, then only Greeks. But only geeks read fine prints. You nevertheless look at the small words Bungeomatic. The only magic bungee code that automatically knows the task you have in mind expands and contracts as needed. The even smaller print below reads Bungeomatic has not been tested by any government agency and has not been approved for actual use. The Bungeomatic Corporation will accept liability for any failure, catastrophic or otherwise, of the Bungeomatic. Have a nice day. You push aside the slab and climb out. You're in the middle of a graveyard. Mystic types around the sarcophagus you just climbed out of. They're in the middle of some ritual. They drop their torches in panic. The underbrush catches fire quickly and the fall starts to vibrate with a low rumble. You recognize the symptoms of a completed quest and do a little fleeing yourself. You run for what seems like hours through the dark forest, tripping and falling over roots and scattering all your possessions to the four winds. At last you emerge on the other side and collapse in exhaustion on the road. Near a tavern. Meanwhile, why haven't your men killed Eric, Sir Pectoral? Uh, what, what? Never fear, Your Highness. He's been lucky so far, but he will not elude us for long. Not that I know what elude means. But now that our mission is almost complete, Your Majesty. Will you not share with me your plans for Taurus once the Darien fool fought is out the way? Gladly, Sir Pectoral. Think of our kingdom as it is today. A provincial backwater with scarcely any social amenities or culture. Firstly, our peasants are crude and uneducated. We need to attract a better class of people to our kingdom, people of refinement and taste. To do so, we must build luxurious dwellings of exquisite grandeur. Next, we must replace the path and cow trails upon which we now travel with elegant tree-lined avenues whose classic proportions will be pleasing to the eye. Then we'll begin to attract artisans from all over the world. They'll come and decorate the walls of our city with fruits of their artistic genius. city grows, we will create a merchant's quarter where people may come by and sell goods. Fine restaurants will open to cater to international taste of those who travel here. I see a McDonald's! Oh fuck, I want a Big Mac now. By now, we should be crossroads of tourists. The royal family will move out to the stuffy old castle and into modern accommodations. Commerce will flourish, and the kingdom will be at the height of its glory. Now, stick it in my hole, please. The queen wants to get some ding-ding. Finally, we shall reopen the castle as a tourist attraction that people may come and witness how well we have preserved our unique culture. In this way, it will never be said that we abandon our precious heritage in the face of modern improvements. This is my dream. 
a shining city on a hill where beauty and culture abound, a place of understated elegance where the arts flourish and every man is a connoisseur. Think of it, Sir Pectoral, and then compare it to the squalor in which we now live. Listen well, Sir Pectoral. All that stands in the way of this glorious future is that meddlesome Sir Eric. Find him, Pectoral! Find him and kill him! Lest we be doomed to our current way of life forever! Alright folks, that about wraps it up for this video. Stay tuned for episode 4 in the quest of the wrench. Thanks for watching.